Man, this thing is ugly. If I show this on YouTube, everybody's going to make fun of me. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. It's an ancient machinist tradition to modify your machine tools to make them safer, more efficient, more pleasant to use, that sort of thing. This is a collection of stuff that I've done to my machines, along with stuff that I've seen other people do that I think you might like. And I'm sure you've got other ideas, things that you've done to your machines that I've missed, so comment down below. Okay, let's go. First up is slide locks. A lot of budget import lathes don't have locks on everything that moves, and you do want locks on everything that moves. In this case, you might notice there's one cap screw here that does not have a jam nut on it, and this is the lock for my cross slide. So this guy here with an Allen key can be locked, and then these guys are the gib adjusters. So if you don't have a lock on your cross slide, it's quite easy to simply drill and tap a hole here for a screw just like this. And if you want to be fancy about it, you can also put a dimple on the gib on the inside there so that this guy registers in that, but that's probably optional. Also visible here is this strange looking contraption. This is the carriage lock on this lathe. Now they provided this nice big Allen head cap screw here for the lock, but well, you see the problem. Depending on where the cross slide happens to be located, the gib adjusters block this lock. Super annoying. And it also means you can't leave the wrench in place in that lock, which is very convenient when you're turning to a shoulder because, well, now it's going to interfere with the cross slide as you're trying to do operations. So to get around this problem, I made this little guy out of some scrap, and it is literally just a piece of scrap that I drilled a hole in, filed that hole into a hexagon, and pressed the end of an old Allen key into it that I cut off. And then that guy just lives in there and it's clear of all of these cap screws. And then I can lock the carriage and unlock it at will, no matter where it is. Yeah, I really should make something more attractive here, but I literally made this in 10 minutes in the first week that I started using this lathe because this drove me crazy and I kept meaning to make a nicer one. And then five years happened and well, here we are. One of the annoying things about small lathes is that the compounds are very small, and so the compound hand wheel is quite fussy to manipulate. So if you're turning a lot of tapers, this gets old really, really fast. So a simple trick to make this more pleasant is to get an old pen cap. This is actually a brass one that I turned for a pen project, but any old regular pen cap will actually work. And now you have a speed handle on your compound. Or if you have an old Sharpie cap, that also works very well. Another great trick I've seen people do is to simply make a T out of some round bar, and then you can put that in a hand drill and uh, turn your compound that way, get a power feed on your compound. If you're turning a lot of tapers or a lot of back and forth, that might be useful. The compound travel on these small lathes is so short. This is about two, two and a half inches that that's probably overkill. This here seems to work quite well for me. Speaking of locks, here's the most important lock on a small lathe, the compound slide lock. What? Quinn, you're crazy. True, but that doesn't make me wrong. The one thing that lathes this size have in very low supply is rigidity. So anything you can do to improve rigidity is going to be a huge win. And one of the best things you can do is keep your compound locked. This is a big source of rigidity loss up here, especially if the end of it is hanging past the slide. So you want to keep that guy flush on the end there, and then keep it locked down unless you really, really need it. I also keep these gibs a little on the tight side, and uh, that also helps. And if you really want to maximize rigidity, take a page from the Stefan book, eliminate your compound, mill yourself up a block the same height, and stick it in here. Because really, take a step back and ask yourself, how much single point threading or short taper cutting do you really do? Maybe swapping out the compound when you need it occasionally is not that big a deal. So food for thought. Now I can already feel the commenters spooling up all of the other things the compound can do for you. And yes, the compound has many other uses. It's helpful to turn it parallel to the ways sometimes. You can do a little cosine math and use it as a very fine feed on your cross slide. And there's many other little tricks that you can do. But on a small lathe, the price and rigidity that we pay for having this guy here is pretty high. Now I've kept it on here, but I've definitely thought about taking it off. It's been here for five years, but we'll see how much longer it lasts. And this next one might seem silly, but it's actually very helpful. Label things, especially if they are unintuitive and potentially dangerous to get them wrong. 
This lathe has regular power feed and also power cross feed chosen with this lever here. And the trick is one of them is over and down and the other one is back and up. And if you get that wrong, there's a good chance you'll crash something and nothing on here is labeled. So it's very easy to forget which way is which amongst those confusing four motions that you have to go through. So I keep this guy labeled, carriage power feed over up, cross slide power feed back and down. It's a simple thing that has saved me a lot of potential grief. Similarly, over here on the quick change gearbox, using that term loosely with hobby lathes, I've marked the feed speeds that you get out of this transmission here because they're marked A, B, and C, which is part of the chart that sets up for threading, but those don't map linearly to the feed speeds when you have the feed gears in there. So A is actually medium, B is the fastest, and C is the slowest. So once again, to avoid mixing that up in the heat of the moment, I just labeled them. And speaking of gearing, one of the first things you can do on a new import lathe is take all the change gears apart and clean them up. Your machine likely came with a whole mess of gears and bushings and other paraphernalia that are combined in various alchemies to create different thread pitches and also possibly different feed rates depending on the machine. And if it's anything like most import lathes, the fit and finish on these gears is gonna be pretty terrible. So you're gonna to want to spend some time deburring the bores and the keyways and cleaning up the bushings and just make all of the parts fit together smoothly and nicely. Otherwise, messing with change gears is gonna be a huge chore and it's not something that you will enjoy. So it's worth spending two, three hours with the deburring tools and some files and some memory cloth and clean all the stuff up. Everything here should slide together smoothly like adult Lego. You shouldn't have to tap anything or pry on anything or jam anything together. It should all just click together very smooth and very nicely. So if it doesn't do that, spend more time deburring and cleaning up those bores and keyways, etc. Another area that's ripe for modification are the maintenance areas of the machine. Just like on a car, all the gearboxes on machine tools have to have the oil changed periodically. And on this particular lathe, guess where the drain plug is for the quick change gearbox? right there. Not only is it too high, it's not at the bottom of the sump, it's also behind the change gears. That's super terrible. So I've changed the oil on this guy once so far, but next time I do it, I'm going to put a new drain plug right there. Amazingly, that drain plug might be the better of the two on this machine. The carriage gearbox drain plug is under here. It's so close here that a regular Allen wrench won't even fit, and I had to make this special stubby one to get in there. So make yourself some little tools like this as needed and keep them in the toolbox with your lathe tools. But seriously, how did they expect you to get in there? This thing's built like a British car. And here's an easy win for quality of life. Go to Target or Walmart or wherever and get yourself the cheapest cookie sheet that they sell. And you have yourself an easy to clean chip tray. These small lathes can be hard to get in and around with your hands when it's time to clean up. And this guy makes quick work of that. Job done. And of course it doesn't catch every single chip, but you know, you gotta leave something for the apprentice to do. I don't know if this counts as a mod exactly, but here's a tip anyway. Recipe boxes are the exact right size to hold quarter size sheets of emery paper. So I keep this next to the lathe and they come with these little index cards, which you can use to sort them by grit. And I keep my scotch brights in here as well. Another great thing that I recommend doing pretty much right away is make yourself a set of copper soft jaws. I have them for the three and four jaw chuck. And I actually have a separate video called Stupid Four Jaw Chuck Tricks where I show how to make these guys, but you can see that they're just folded out of some copper sheet material. And uh, they're more useful on the four jaw than they are on the three jaw because the three jaw you're probably not using for a second operation, which is where you wanna protect an already machined surface. And also on the three jaw, they tend to introduce a lot of runout. Whereas on the four jaw, that doesn't matter because you're dialing out that runout. But uh, I do occasionally use them on the three jaw as well. So it's worth making a set uh, for both chucks and maybe make them fit a little better than this one. What is this thing's problem? Just, could you print? Just, can we just cut all this out? Yeah, you're gonna edit that out, right? Okay, good. I don't wanna look like an idiot up here. And I'll finish with a couple of mods from, let's say, viewer mail, things that uh, other people have told me they've done to their lathes, which 
sound like really good ideas to me. One is a cross slide stop. So the idea is you put an adjustable stop back here that mounts on the back of the carriage. And so you can get repeatable depths just like you would with say a stop on your mill table. And that would be great for things like cutting O-ring grooves or anytime you need to do multiple plunging operations with a tool. Another one that a lot of people suggest is when using the four jaw chuck to make a second chuck key so that you have two keys that you can use on either side of the chuck. And people say that makes it a lot quicker and easier to dial in the four jaw. I have not tried that myself, but it does sound like a good idea. Here's another simple idea. Make yourself a special wrench for the tool post. Now, a lot of people will make a dedicated thing that sits on this nut or even replace the entire mounting post with a permanently attached lever of some sort that locks and unlocks the tool post. I think that's a great idea, but this solution has worked really well for me. So this is a 17 millimeter bolt on here. So I went to the big box store, bought the cheapest, crappiest 17 millimeter wrench that I could, lopped the end off it and ground it all nice and smooth. And the reason that I went with this is, uh, well, A, I have a perfect little pocket here in my apron for this wrench. And B, it happens to be the same size as the uh, hardware on my strap clamp set on the mill and a couple of other things around my shop. And as I've made new tools, I continue to make them with 17 millimeter hardware. For example, my steady rest or uh, other uh, fixtures that I make and or modify to use this 17 millimeter wrench for everything. So this wrench lives in my apron and I use it a thousand times a day. Very quick to pull it in and out. One wrench for everything. Super, super handy. Over to the mill now for a couple of mods here. The first one I did is these little brass knobs, which you've seen on my channel before. And these replace the factory kip handles, which were uh, excessively long for this machine. These are fairly full-size handles for a very small machine. And so they were constantly in the way. They would snag on the Y table slide and they would interfere with the vise. If you weren't constantly monitoring the positions of these things as you use the machine, they would inevitably get snagged and bent as this one has been. So these were a pain in the patootie. These little brass knobs were a 30 minute lathe project. They're never in the way and they work great. I've got some commercial mods on my machine as well. This is the uh, quill stop from Priest Tools. I've shown this in previous videos and uh, this guy uh, works really, really well. It uh, adds a very useful feature to a mill that doesn't otherwise have one. Uh, the only thing I have left to do on this is uh, do something better with the routing of this wiring. I've got it hacked up there with a zip tie for now. This is just a, an old safety switch that isn't used anymore. If you have a Precision Matthews machine, go check out Greg at Priest Tools. He's got some great accessories for it. Full disclosure, he did send me this kit for free, but with no strings attached, and I just like it very much. One thing that's very different between mills and lathes is that mills really, really throw chips. Like they will make a mess of eight feet around your mill, whereas the lathe pretty much just drops all of its chips into the chip tray, maybe a couple of feet on the floor around it, but generally speaking, they stay pretty well behaved. Mills are a huge mess. So uh, something like this is great for that. This is a chip shield. This is another freebie from Priest Tools. Looks like it's co-branded with a little machine shop as well. Maybe they sell it through there. And uh, it's magnetic and it sticks on the end of your vise and it's got these adjustable wings on it. I like that it's removable so that uh, you can still access, you know, the tool and your setup whenever you need. And then when you're just doing heavy cuts, especially if you're cutting left to right and the cutter is throwing the chips at you, then dropping this thing on there is really great. I've also got a smaller version that was donated to the channel by MM and LS. And I'll link to all of these folks in the description below. But you can see that this guy is also a, a nice size for when I'm doing smaller work uh, in closer to the vise so it doesn't interfere with the head. It's uh, handy to have both of these and uh, <laughs> he uh, helpfully engraved it with my logo there, which was pretty slick. Now the one downside to these guys is of course, anything involving magnets in, in the machine shop is uh, always a problematic endeavor because of this problem. Yeah, yeah, magnets collect chips and they're pretty hard to clean. Once this happens, the chips get magnetized and yeah, it's kind of a hassle. So one thing I'm considering doing is uh, just covering the magnets with blue tape. And then when the chips pile up like that, I can just maybe peel the tape off. I haven't tried that yet. It seems like it'll work, but in the meantime, uh, I just live with uh, a blob of chips on the magnets. So uh, yeah, magnets in the machine shop, mm, other than the uh, Noga bases that turn on and off, uh, they're not always a great idea. 
A similar mod that I would like to do is actually uh, some acrylic shields for behind the table and maybe the ends of the table as well, just to really contain the chips because I've got uh, a small workshop here and so I've got workbenches on both sides of all my machines and so what happens is the mill throws chips all over my main workbench because it's it's right here. So uh, I've seen other people do this where you put in adjustable uh, acrylic sides around the table to really contain the chips and also makes cleanup a lot easier at the end of the session. So uh, also something I'm considering but I haven't done that yet. You might have noticed a theme in all of my mods and hacks for these machines, and that is efficiency. I am obsessed with efficiency because I like to get a lot done in my limited time that I have here in the shop in between my 60 hour weekday job and editing video. But uh, one of those areas is the draw bar. And uh, like many small benchtop mills, it came with this kind of cheesy wrench that you're supposed to use, but it's a square drive. And so this thing is never aligned the way you want. And it's kind of fussy to get it on and off of there. And you have to turn the draw bar a lot. So this wrench gets old very, very fast. Now this is a 10 millimeter square drive. And as it happens, that's the same as a metric dimension of pipe plug. So this is a 10 millimeter pipe plug socket. And I keep it on a socket wrench that I bought on eBay, for very little money. And this is a very quick way because it's ratcheting. It's very quick to undo and redo the drawbar. This little change has probably saved me, I don't know, 100 hours of my life over the course of several years of tool changes on this machine. Now the next step up would be a pneumatic or electric drawbar and uh, Greg at uh, Priest Tools does also sell a pneumatic drawbar. I don't have air permanently in my shop and I don't have space for it so I don't ha have that option here, but that is something else to consider. I've made a very similar change down here on the vise. This is a four inch milling vise, it's Taiwanese made. I bought this from Precision Matthews. It's their high precision option when you buy these machines. It comes with this style of vise handle, which you've probably seen. You can slide it on and you've got lots of leverage or you can straighten it out and twist it for quicker motion. These things are okay, but I'm not a huge fan. It's also quite heavy and it's very long. And so it's in the way of the Y axis uh, crank a lot, much like the table locks. It's just over scale for this machine. It's not a good choice for a small mill like this. To solve this problem, you may have seen the cool kids on YouTube using those edge technology speed handles. They look very similar to this. The problem is this is a four inch vise with a nine sixteenths drive, which is smaller than those big six inch Kurt vices that all the cool kids use. So this speed handle I bought on eBay. There's a hobbyist whose name I'm sorry I have forgotten. If I can look it up and find it, I will list it in the show notes below. He doesn't have a mark on this, but uh, a fellow makes these in his garage for smaller vices and he sells them on eBay. So this is a 916th drive with the same design as the edge. So you can slide it on there for quick motion and then you can move it over when you need the leverage. And the nice thing about this is on a small mill like this, it's not in the way of the crank on the Y axis. So that right there is a huge quality of life win. Another great quality of life win, especially on small mills is make yourself a dedicated machinist hammer. This was uh, a great Saturday afternoon project on the lathe. It's just uh, you know, a central section here and then a handle. And then there are two ends that are threaded in and I've got an aluminum end on here and a brass end. I need to make a, a nylon end as well, something softer, but uh, uh, this is a smaller size than like commercial machinist hammers that you can buy. So it's a really good fit for getting into the smaller spaces on a hobby mill like this. So uh, I may do a video on a hammer like this. If you're interested, uh, let me know. This is uh, a really fun little lathe project and I use this thing a hundred times a day. So this is probably one of the most useful things that uh, I ever made on my lathe, honestly. And once again, flirting with the definition of mod here, but uh, I made this little bracket on the mill to relocate the limit switch that came with the power feed. Now it came with a bracket very similar to this. It's basically a T-shaped bracket that mounts on the four corners of this limit switch. And then it has a slotted hole here that mounts to the front of the mill. The problem is it was about two times the size of what would actually fit in the space. And the limit switch stuck up above the table when the plastic cover was in place, which I have lifted up here. So uh, yeah, this thing just didn't fit in the space that was allotted for it. So not a great design, but an hour on the mill and I was able to knock out this lower profile version of the same bracket. I did a blog post on this project, which I will link to below. It's always extra satisfying to make parts for the mill on the mill itself.
And with the cover back in place, you can see it clears the vise and still has the travel that it needs to act as a limit switch. It's also really good at collecting chips. Yeah. So those are the few of the little modifications that I've made. I'm sure you've got lots of good ideas and things that you've done to your machines. So uh, leave a comment below and share your ideas with everybody. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.